Welcome to Marriott Library's Facebook Live event. My name is Allison Maurer. I'm a librarian at Marriott Library, big fan of books and reading and the wonderful culture they create for all of us. I'm joined with Jordan Hansen, marketing and PR specialist and creative genius at Marriott Library. We're very excited for today's event, a conversation with Malaysia Garfield on black nerdiness. We've got our own questions from Elijah, who I will introduce here shortly about his favorite comic books, TV shows and films. If you want to join in by asking your own, please submit them on the library's Facebook page and Jordan will watch for them. Marriott Library does these events as part of our mission, which is to inspire the creation, discovery, and use of knowledge for Utah and the world. And to that end, this event with Malaysia most certainly fits the bill. Malaysia Garfield is the director of the UVU Black Cultural Center. He oversees the mission of the center, which seeks to counteract persistent campus-wide and global anti-Blackness and to holistically enrich, educate, and advocate for students, faculty, and staff through Black-centered programming, promotion of equity and justice initiatives, culturally affirming educational initiatives, and retention strategies. Malaysia's role is to direct and strategically plan surrounding this mission and to also act as a model for the state. He brings expertise on the implementation, development, and evaluation of programs aimed at promoting awareness of the African diaspora. Welcome, Malaysia, and what an incredible mission. We hope this event will be culturally affirming and enriching. Malaysia provided us beforehand with a list of comic books, TV shows, and films that have impacted him. He calls them Malaysia's nerd picks, which we just really love, of course, as fellow nerds. So uh, Jordan's gonna post a link to Malaysia's list so you can follow along, but that's what we're gonna be talking with him about today. And we have matched Malaysia's list with what is in the library's collection and we have compiled them onto a guide. We call them lib guides or campus guides. Jordan's also gonna post a link to that so you can follow along there as well. It's also where we're gonna post the video archive of this event. So watch for that to go live there. Malaysia, you suggested so many great titles. I mean, <laughs> Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse is just the best. And I love Luke Cage. I actually haven't yet read the Monica Rambeau comic books, but because you mentioned them, I am definitely interested. So let's just talk about some of these suggestions. Maybe let's just start with the TV shows because I was kind of surprised by some of your TV show suggestions. And, and because I'm a TV holic, like <laughs> especially like right now during the pandemic, but just like throughout my life, I'm a TV holic. So you had suggested the Rugrats. Yes. Should I go back and watch that? And how did this show impact you? My, uh, the Rugrats. Yes, first of all, yes, definitely go back and watch that show. I mean, if it's a 90s classic. But on top of that, um, it really opened my mind to just having imagination because they would always go on like little adventures and they're like babies. And I'm like, what are they doing? <laughs> but you got Tommy Pickles usually walking around with a little screwdriver in his pocket and he's able to kind of just go um, anywhere and lead the charge with all the babies. Uh, but it really just, when I was a child, because I was born in the 90s, it was like, really opening my eyes to be like, oh, okay, I can have a broad imagination and it's not something that you should be ashamed of. Uh, and then on top of that, that you just let your, uh, the freedom of your expression be pushed out. So it's like one of my favorite picks. Also on there, like I think Susie on the Rugrats kind of gets under, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I appreciate it, but she's amazing. Always kind of clashing back at uh, Angelica, and it's just like they're like two going back with the going back and forth with each other. But great characters, great characters all around. I also was a big fan of like the um, when they did the all grown up 
series as well. When they that was come. so good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like that as well. Um, and then the special episodes that they paid homage to it as well on the regular series. Uh, but it was nice. That's a beautiful sentiment, like the power of imagination and having like a show or a book sort of encourage that is pretty major. Like it can definitely sometimes feel like in this day and age that like, for some reason, like imagination and curiosity is not always encouraged. Mm -hmm. So yeah, anything that in pop culture that is like trying to really cultivate that, then yeah, I, I can totally see that. I think that's great. Yes. <laughs> so Jordan and I, we kind of wanted just to alternate between these questions. So it's not just me moderating and talking here. So Jordan's going to take the next few questions. Yeah, I was just curious uh, on the on the movie picks, um, like what what uh, I haven't even heard of the last one before. Before you even put that on there, I still need to watch that. The Meteor uh, Man. Meteor Man. Meteor Man. <laughs> <laughs> I did Google that? it a couple of twice. Oh my gosh, I'm excited to get that in our collections. <laughs> uh, yes, it's. Uh... My, my favorite on this list is actually Men in Black, but I'll talk a little bit about Meteor Man and then also tell you about Men in Black. Yeah. Meteor Man, um, I don't know if you're familiar with like the Waynes family, and the mm -hmm. Waynes yeah. brothers, and that whole comedic family. Yeah. Um, one of the members of the Waynes family kind of created, um, as well as Robert Townsend, um, which was a film uh, filmmaker, Robert Townsend. He's not part of the Waynes family, uh -huh. um, but really good filmmaker uh he i think directed the movie i think it was the temptation or not the temptations he, no it was the five heartbeats um and a couple other movies he directed as well but really prolific um black filmmaker and he kind of just was like hey i'm gonna create this superhero movie that's take, that takes place at like this inner city and it's just like it's unexpected. The, the villain in that movie, they have like these fades and they're, they wear like these suits and they go around. It, it, you just have to watch it. I don't want to like, spoil anything, but really I'm excited. It. It's, it's funny because like, if you think about it, uh, especially in 2018, when we were talking about like Black Panther as like the first major blockbuster black superhero film. And I was like, mm -hmm. no. We had Blade as well as we had Meteor Man, like right. several 20 so years before, prior. And so um, really just kind of understanding the fact on that is like, they were pioneers in this genre of superhero films. Um, and so I really just like the Meteor Man. It's like a cult classic. It's not amazing, but it's great. It's just yeah. a good feel superhero movie. Uh, I think it was better than... Um, I'm trying to see the movie that Shaq played in. Uh, oh, it's like, I always get it confused with like Shazam, but Kazam? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Wait. I what it's called. I think it, it was uh, like Shield or something. I don't know. But he, yeah, I think it was better than the, the, the Shaq superhero film that came out as well. But this was like the movie. That, uh, but Men in Black is my all time favorite, like just out there. Uh, I think I had it on VHS and I think I've watched it maybe over 130 times. Oh my uh, gosh. <laughs> I don't know what it is about Men in Black. That's but awesome. it was... <laughs> the, the thing about Men in Black, you just have like Will Smith, you got uh, Tommy Lee Jones, and it's just like this classic duo. It plays on that trope of um, kind of like a fish out of water, but also like this buddy cop film. Um, but they're also fighting extraterrestrial aliens. It's just, it's out of there, but I just loved it because it just reminds me so much of like the 90s. Right. And I'm just like, yes, <laughs> this is Will Smith at his prime. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny you mentioned it, that you have it on VHS because I was putting that library guy together of your list and I was like, oh my gosh, we only have Men in Black on VHS. This is unacceptable. So we totally had to order a DVD. <laughs> yes. But, I don't have a VCR anymore, but yes. Yeah, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to alter the library guide a little bit, and I'm going to say, yeah, we also have this VHS, which Malaysia watched his over 130, so, you know, I'm going to make a note about that. That's how it should be watched, and that in its original intended format. 
Yeah. I didn't really like the uh, the third. It was the third Men in Black. The but, time the time travel one. Yeah, the time it was the uh, But the first yeah. and second one uh, was like, yes, this is prime time. Uh, Will Smith is at his prime. He's doing his thing. I think this was like. I think this was even before he made Independence Day or a little bit after. I think this was Oh before. yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um and so it was just like this black action hero. Um he's also teamed up with Tommy Lee Jones, which is a pretty good actor as well. And then like it's just amazing. I, I just love it. <laughs> right. Oh my gosh. Like yeah, I always think back to like the iconic, like the when they're all like shooting like the like cardboard cutouts like oh my gosh that scene always like gives me chills like oh my gosh how did he know like oh yeah just explain it uh i think really on that aspect uh especially like with that scene and then the scene where he's trying to fill out the it was like a certain well, not the survey but the application and yeah that's <laughs> yeah uh but when he was shooting it just kind of gives you insight like oh this person everyone thinks that they have to be perfect and know exactly what they have to do but will smith is like nah you have to have street smarts on top of that other particular intelligence as far right. as an, uh, an agent or a soldier per se and you have to have that street smarts and he was just like look this is yeah you gotta never underestimate everything that's going on in the picture right. <laughs> that's true oh my gosh oh Someone posted in the comments, Kazam was, a, 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 is that what we were talking about? Yes, with, uh, with Jack, yep, yep. yep. <laughs> Thank you, Lorelai. <laughs> yeah, the sliding, someone commented, yeah, the sliding the table over scene, just, yeah, that long like noise and it goes on for just like a little bit longer than you think it's going to, it just goes. <laughs> yes, yes. Really good. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the the little cricket the little tiny gun like it's just mm -hmm. all like <laughs> it's like an instant classic you know there's so many memorable moments yeah it's different than like maybe a superhero movie it's sort of like a little bit in between like you had the Django Unchained too on your yeah. and Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse and like I mean those are like at two different spectrums and it seems like Men in Black is maybe a little bit in between it's like kind of comical like you said so it's like kind of got that element to it but it's not quite totally superhero-esque but then it's got more like that real life feel like exactly like you said like you got to think on your feet you got to have like this super like this different level of intelligence and mm -hmm. I wouldn't even, because um, you mentioned the Django Unchained, it is on my list. And one of the reasons why I picked that as well, the Django, again, is actually uh, the, uh, the series of films by Quentin Tarantino is like, he's my favorite director. Oh, other, really? Uh, other than, um, what's his name? Uh, Spike Lee. So Spike uh, Lee and Quentin Tarantino are like my feel, favorite directors, filmmakers of all time, both of them together. But Quentin Tarantino, it was the Django Unchained, Hateful Eight, um, and Glorious Bastards. Like that three movies right there are like, wow. <laughs> Just the I'm a really big heavy depth, heavy devil uh ooh, dialogue kind of person. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. It's just really like you have to listen. It's not like everything is going on at once. It builds up to something, but really listening to the conversations really gets you. Right. <laughs> yeah, like the dialogue, his dialogue can be kind of com edging on comical too. Like they're pretty serious topics that he takes on. But yeah, if you're really listening to the back and forth, it's like, it's especially in Glorious Bastards, it's like just, you can laugh out loud at moments. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the tension is always, in, every yeah. other, in all those movies, the tension is always there. Like, oh, what is going on? And you're just yeah. listening and it's like, what is it really going this way? And then it completely turns something else. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I know. Movies like that make me wish I had one, like some sort of memory wipe where I could just watch it for the first time and just like be unexpected, like not know what's coming. Like, oh my gosh. Right. <laughs> yes. Yes. Right. I know. And but Spike Lee films are like, they're in their own kind of genre, mm -hmm. I think. Because I I love how he is really like a social commenter 
you know, like, but the, it's so engaging. Like it doesn't feel like farcical or comical or anything. It just is like these real life stories, but from like a pretty powerful perspective. And I, but without being like too heavy, you know? Yep. You know what's funny? Uh, someone that is actually shared in between both Quentin Tarantino and Spike Lee is Samuel Jackson. Samuel Jackson is in a lot of both of their movies. Uh, and he's just like that central piece that we underestimate Samuel Jackson, but like he's like one of the highest paid actors of all time. He's been in over, I think, 100 films. <laughs> he's <laughs> just like, whoa. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, Samuel Jackson is like the connecting thread between like all those movies and like a ton of comic book stuff and like nerd stuff. Like, yes. <laughs> I mean, he's like, he's the, he's the head of S.H.I.E.L.D. Like, and then he's also right. like Glass, which is like a, a superhero, That's like ice right. movie, like right. he's at the center of a lot. So yes. I wonder if he has a memoir. Well, I would read that. I would read it. Totally, because like, don't you think that'd be really interesting to kind of hear his perspective on like Marvel and Quentin Tarantino and Spike Lee? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's an interesting guy. And Star Wars. I mean, I forgot Star Wars. I mean, he was in Star Wars too. Really? Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's everywhere. <laughs> uh, we usually, uh, it's like. We never really think about it, but yeah, he's like in every, he connects so many things. Oh. Yeah. Hmm. The, the, the Samuel Jackson universe, it's all connected, <laughs> it's all one. <laughs> um, so the next section on your list is your list of your favorite comic books. Uh, again, if you're just joining us right now in the comments, there's a list that you can follow along with what we're talking about. Um, so you have a list of these comic books. How? What, how did you first get introduced into comics um, and how, like, explain some of these picks? Yes, great, great, great question. Um, so I pay homage to my father, actually, for getting me into comic books. Um, my father and I, when I was a little bitty child, uh, my father really was into Marvel Comics. Um, and he would, like, I don't know what it was, but he would put me on to all these different comic books. We would watch like all these, uh, we would watch X-Men on uh, Fox Saturday morning cartoons. We would watch uh, the old Avengers show, the Spider-Mans, the Batmans. Um, he would just put me on to watching all these superhero cartoon shows and then these comic books. Um, but, and then my brother and I, as well as my father, we all kind of like get into this huge nerdy argument like, who do we think is the like most powerful superheroes who are not, uh, who do we think can get their way out of the situation? Um, but my, my dad's favorite heroes are the Incredible Hawk and the Silver Surfer. Um, and for a time that was my favorite kind of characters until I really branched off into myself and did my own reading, like fully invested in doing some readings. Mm -hmm. And so my favorite today, which I put on the list, um, has to do with both my identity as being a black person, but also on top of that, just like these particular comic books are not necessarily, besides like Black Panther because of the movie and everything has really gone into the mainstream, but some of these other people are not um, as mainstream as I would love them to be. And they have such rich stories um, and they connect so many things. So the first uh, comic book that I really got into when I was, I believe I was like in middle school, was the Luke Cage and Iron Fist. Um, and of course they had a Netflix show with Luke Cage and it was connecting with the Defenders, with Iron Fist, uh, Jessica Jones, Daredevil. But with Luke Cage, it was just like, this man is bulletproof. Uh, a, a black, just think about it like, uh, during the times of like, you got police brutality, you got all these different things going on in the world, and you got this bulletproof black man that has, ex that has extra strength, and he lives in Harlem, Harlem, right. New York. Right. <laughs> and it's just like, he's just an epitome of like streetness. Uh, he's in the hood, but he's also like, I don't know, it's something about him, this represents me. It reminds me, I'm originally from Rochester, New York, 
So it really just reminds me of this home and this hero that really represents those that he's not as flashy as the Black Panther. He doesn't have an entire nation behind him or the tech where he doesn't have the several degrees that Black Panther um, has. But he's just like the street smarts hero. He went to prison. Um, they experimented on him in prison and then he got out and he was innocent. Um, and it pays homage to all those people that have um, had to pay dues on crimes that they were um, never, they were innocent of essentially. Um, right. And really kind of just paying homage to that. And so I really like this Luke Cage because he's like this heartful kind of guy. He loves, he's like, he's like Captain America, but for, yeah. but for the black community, that, but also like New York. He's the Captain right. America. Captain America's from Brooklyn. And then you got Luke Cage from Harlem. Yeah. <laughs> Two different type of people. But I love just both of them. And they kind of have the same kind of philosophy where they must protect everybody. They right. must stand strong, but on top of that, they represent two different types of um, communities, essentially. Um, mm -hmm. Captain America being the all of America, and then Luke Cage is like, nah, my home is Harlem, New York, the in the streets, doing it, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, but I really like uh, uh, Luke Cage, and then when he pairs up with Iron Fist, it's like a duo, and then uh, they didn't do ju justice for Iron Fist in the um in the show, the TV show. No, this is really into like he's really into hip hop. Uh, he's like he he likes Wu Tang Clan. He listens to it all the time. He's like always did not get that at all. <laughs> I'm just like, what is going on? <laughs> what is just this on? like wimpy little kid? Like, oh. yeah. and he's in the show. He's like, oh, I am the Iron Fist. This is that. No. Iron Fist was witty. He was like he was like a Deadpool kind of witty. Yeah. I mean, he was also on top of that had that extra pizzazz because he was like in the hip hop. But on the TV show, I was just like, this is they are doing Iron Fist no justice. <laughs> I know. I he they definitely got like him the worst in terms of like the defenders. Yes. <laughs> Everyone else was like, okay, pretty spot on. Like, great. This is good. And then just like, ah, uh, falls apart. Like, oh, man. <laughs> so hopefully yeah. once they like reintegrate them into like whatever they're doing on Disney Plus, like. Did you hear uh, with uh, Spider-Man, Spider-Man, uh, the, th the third film that's supposed to come out, supposed to be later this year. Yeah. Um, but the third Spider-Man film. They already con uh, Daredevil will be making an appearance in it. The, the Daredevil Charlie Cox mm -hmm, from the television show. He'll be making an appearance as well as um, some others. But I'm like excited. Dang. So that's kind of be their universe. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's exciting. <laughs> yes, I'm excited. But yeah, as far as other comic books, like I said, Luke Cage was a special one for me. Um, Blade was definitely special. Again, it goes back to his movies really kicked off the Marvel kind of movies because it was like one of the first marvel big blockbuster films back in the day it don't it made like 280 million dollars but of course today you got marvel films making a billion yeah. so on and so forth but if you factor in inflation like blade was making some real money back in the day mm -hmm. as the first debut of basically marvel taking a chance on superhero films and with blade it, you don't even, at the time, I didn't even know it was really like a Marvel film, but it shows a little Marvel thing on top um, before the credits roll. And then Blade has this cinematic universe that ties vampires into the, the Marvel cinematic universe. And I'm glad that they're rebu um, rebooting him for uh, what's coming up. They'll make another re remaking a uh, Blade series. Is he getting his own series or is he launching into Morbius? Uh, he's, he's getting his own movie. Um, so this movie, they announced, they announced it, was it, um, Kevin Feige, he announced it last year with a couple other movies like with Moon. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, they announced Blade at the very end, um, and he's getting his own movie again. So they're bringing it back, I'm happy. Uh, That's but gonna be awesome. Really just Blade is awesome too, because very dark, and it's like a dark take on vampires, and mm -hmm. like, ah, uh, you never really think about it, and it's this man that has... He's a vampire, but also human. And so he can transcend and go into different places. And he's like a vampire slayer. It's just, it's amazing. 
He's oh. the original Vampire Slayer. He's so cool. Yes. Um, the next person I had in mind also, as far as in comic books, is Storm. Um, a lot of people also don't talk about Storm. Um, Storm is an Omega level, uh, level mutant, meaning mm-hmm. she's like one of the powerful, most powerful mutants of the X-Men. Oh. Um, behind like um, Xavier and um, ooh, what's his name? Ah, no! Magneto? Magneto, yes. Yeah. Magneto and a couple others. Like she's also in that level of Omega level, which is like one of the top tier um, X-Men um, type of people, um, immunes, I would say. And Storm is like the story of her, which also doesn't get much respect, is that she's from Africa. Um, she really controls the weather. Like mm. how how powerful is that? Like you can control the entire weather, like you can literally change. The makeup of what Earth can be by the weather patterns and things of that nature, um, and then they, this connection. I like that they pay homage, like in a way, she's like Mother Earth in a way. Wow, um, that's cool. But just like, how do you melt that together? It's just it's amazing. And then on top of that, in the comic books, um, even though it was a short lived, she gets married to Black Panther. Yeah, um, wow. a whole ceremony with all the the X Men, the Avengers, and all of them attending. Oh, really? Um, but they got divorced uh, <laughs> a little bit later because I think it was with uh, what, what series, Kevin? I think it was Civil War, which they did the movie adaption, but in the comic mm-hmm. books, um, it was like the X-Men versus the Avengers. And she had to take the side of the X-Men because she was just like, nah, we've been fighting as mutants against tyranny forever. Like the government right. trying to control us. We, we, I can't go with you. <laughs> right. And so they had to split. Uh, but they they got married. It was beautiful. Uh, yeah, um, I'd love to see some more like Storm. Like it seems like every time we see Storm, she's already just like just over there in the X. And like we don't ever get to see like her backstory or exactly. she's just there. Like oh okay yeah she's cool. Well, I have to say I'm pretty intrigued by that. I mean, so I'm not a major comic book reader. All right, I'm more of the TV holic, movie holic. But so but I'm. <laughs> The way you're describing Storm and then that connection with Black Panther, I just think like when you have that kind of representation, I think that is so just like wonderful that you get that kind of cultural mm-hmm. perspective. And that that sounds very intriguing to me. So like, would you say like if, if, if there's someone in the audience today who's not a big comic book reader, as maybe I am not as much a comic book reader, would you, do you have like a ranking of like which one you might kind of start with as an intro into this space? Like, would you maybe recommend starting with Storm? Or is there like, what about then Captain Marvel and yeah. Monica Rambeau? That's the same character, right? Or yes, no? uh, well, Captain Marvel, has uh, its own character. They, they made a movie off of Captain Marvel. Uh, Marvel. But yeah, yes. So as far as I'm going to talk about too, the, to kind of get into um, Storm, I would read, I think it was the mid-2000s, there was an issue. I would have to, sorry, I just not at the top of my head. No, you're good. Uh, but when she was the leader of the X-Men and okay. you kind of get a little bit more of her backstory, or what Storm is all about um, and what she's kind of doing. So I would kind of get into that um, as far as in the mid 2000s when, when she was ahead of the X-Men. Um, as far as in Monica Rambeau, yes, um, another powerful uh, superhero. Um, they don't talk about this, but Monica Rambeau was also the first Captain Marvel before there was Captain Marvel. Uh, <laughs> and so like, what does that mean? She's yeah. she's like powerful, right? Sometimes she's a little OP, so she's a little overpowered on the comic books. But she uh, is like she could do pretty much anything, pretty much. Really? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was reading her powers. I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't know how they're. It, it seemed like even in. <laughs> hopefully, everyone's caught up with everything. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. In the latest WandaVision, they hinted at like, oh, she might have something when she yeah. can see that. 
And so I'm like, how are they going to involve all of her powers in the MCU? My goodness. Yes. And the crazy thing is um, she also pays how much, because she was really good friends with um, the now current Captain Marvel. Um, and you kind of see that in the um, original, um, well, the movie that came out, it was a, was it last year or the year before? Yeah. yeah it was, pretty, so yeah. 2019, it came out in 2019. Um, but Captain Marvel, uh, and you kind of pay homage to her mother, was really good friends with Captain Marvel. And then it was kind of passed on as far as in the friendship to her daughter, um, which is Monica. But just, yeah, great. She has amazing powers. She's very powerful. Like her and, um, what is that? I think his name is Blue Marvel. Um, they're like OP super, they're basically like Superman, Superwoman. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, is what's happening currently, it, it, does it have comic origins and like she cut, but I guess it, does the snap, does it come reverse in the same way and like all that happen? Like, so of course with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the movies, they, they take some creative liberties and change right. what happens in the comics. Uh, yeah, some of her story is a little bit different than what is going on, even with the one division show right now. Mm-hmm. So her origin and everything is kind of a little bit different than what happens in the comics. But just know, like, and I'm excited, hopefully with one division that they they explore and go full out on what she's supposed to be doing. Um, but she will be in the next. Uh, I think it was the next Captain Marvel movie she would be in. Um, oh. that they're having Captain Marvel two. And then um, her in Miss Marvel. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yeah. Uh, she's, um, I think she was, she's Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan. Uh, yeah. She's from Pakistan. She's, um, she liked this Muslim superhero as well, Miss Marvel. Mm-hmm. But they team up her, um, Monica Lambeau, as well as Captain Marvel. They do a lot of different things. And they're in this kind of like tier of women superheroes, essentially. Mm-hmm. But amazing. Um, I, I think all of them are kind of OP. <laughs> but I love it. I love their OP. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, but yeah. That's great. So, shifting gears maybe just a little bit, why would you say this intersection of Black nerdiness is important? We were kind of surprised you wanted to call it this. We love that you call it this. And I was, I spent the, all summer watching Woke. And like, uh, I don't know if like me. Yes, on Hulu, yeah. Yes, and it was, I I so resonated with that character, you know, about like that tension between like, I just want to be creative and like, but then I've got like this real life thing going on. And like, so is that kind of where you're seeing this intersection? Yes, uh, so I, I would speak, this is just from my experience. There's a, yeah, there's slightly a different interpretation with the, the show Wolf. Well, for my interpretation of black nerdiness, it's like, Again, black is not a monolith. And with that, like there are people like myself that is really into just as much as any other Joe Smo that's into comic books, movies, television. Um, and I get just as excited for those women. And they don't have to be just black characters. Like I'm just giving you some of my, the, things, the people that resonate with me, but like I enjoy Captain America. I enjoy um, Iron Man and his entire run in the series and things like that. I enjoy these characters. Um, and I just want people to kind of realize that Black nerdiness has been around. And before, I think if you really kind of start with it, um, it goes back to, and this is just because I was born in the 90s, but if you go with like Family Matters and you have, uh, what's his name? Steve Urkel. Right. And that was like your interpretation of- right. Black nerdiness, it was like, he's, he doesn't really know how to get along with the people around him. He's usually kind of like disconnected from the world around him. Right. And so I think, I mean, it's good that that character existed, but like today, understanding that I can be both black, I can be nerdy. There are things in which I'm aware of that is going around in both um, um, back home, but also just where I'm at currently. Like, I'm a black man. I'm in charge of the Black Cultural Center. Uh, 
and I have a connection to blackness, but I also have a passion for nerdiness and just geekdom and reading and movies and television. Like I have that, I love that. It's it's, able, it's a part of me that I'm able to express what I'll always happen to say that, okay, I'm black, but also this. Right. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of say like, hey, as far as the black nerdiness, like those kids that you made fun of in high school and elementary. Right. And it, I find it funny that today, especially like you don't really find that as much. I mean, people still get picked on in school and um, K through 12 and things of that nature. But like geekdom has become mainstream. Right. So like people like you don't get as picked on as much because like, oh, well, yeah, I watch Marvel films too. Right. But I just like, no, I was there <laughs> in middle <laughs> school and elementary school reading comic books staying up late with my dad and just talking about various different things pertaining to superheroes that the average person may not have even heard of, but these stories are so rich and you're able to connect to them. And like I said, being like, like Luke Cage, just connecting with somebody that was like, you're dealing with, um, like in Rochester, New York, we had, uh, was the stop and frisk policy that were um, basically racial profiling right. um, that was happening in New York. Uh, you see this that is happening in your life in real time. And then you go to the comic books and you got Luke Cage. This man is bulletproof. He's a black man in Harlem, New York. And right. he's fighting alongside the cops as a vigilante. And he's a hero for hire. He's like, look, I'm going to take, um, I may not be part of the Avengers, but what I'm going to do is make some cash along with Iron Fist. And we're going to charge out our services to save the neighborhood. And I'm just like, yes, <laughs> be the bill- pillar to the community. And represent your community, but also be like this strong superhero. And I, I just love it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so great. It's a great answer. Um, so, I mean, you we've kind of talked about like that topic of like different films and stuff. Like, what what do you feel like this increased representation we're now seeing has uh, affected in film specifically? I think. For in order to get more stories in the future, so to get people, aspiring filmmakers that may be just children right now, they have to see themselves. Um, they have to see themselves in order to say, look, I can do this. I can create things that are amazing. But if you don't see yourself, rather be in, in literature or movies or television, uh, video games, things of that nature, like if you don't see yourself, like, it's really hard uh, and not to kind of get onto like this soapboxy type of thing, but like with uh, people of color, like we really don't see ourselves as much in these mediums mm-hmm. and you get so many great authors and comic book artists and things like that, that are white and really think about it. They are able, they, they pay homage and respect to the people that they saw when they were growing up as children. Right. And so I think representation is so important for people to really realize like, look, oh, I see this. I see, I can be this. We had just like the vice president, first black and Asian um, woman that is the vice president. Like that means something. I can be the vice president as a black woman or an Asian woman or a woman of color. Like I could be something. I right. see myself in that. And I just say that with myself, like I see myself in this medium and I love it. And it pays, it shows that there's a respect to not only where I come from, but also, you know, just having people realize that there's more to the world than our bubbles that we live and operate in. There's so much happening across the country, but also the globe. And I, I just think we need to pay homage in that. We also need to see ourselves in that as well. Agreed. Yeah, it's- totally agreed. It's like, I mean, not even just films, but like having, like reading a lot of books from a lot of different types of authors from different cultures. And like, yes, being able to see yourself in those books and those stories, it is so important. And like, I think you're right on that there's just like this, there's these little bubbles that we create for ourselves. And like books are such, and movies are such a great way to get out of the bubble. But like you, I mean, what like you said at the top of the show, like if, if 
there's not that kind of like push to be imaginative or like push to have curiosity, then the likelihood that you're going to go beyond your bubble and like read authors that have a different perspective than you or watch movies from directors who are different from you, then the bubble just perpetuates. Yes. Like, and that's totally what frightens me, you know, about like our future. I mean, I just love that we're having this conversation so that like, I mean, I think everything you said is just right on, like just that power that the culture has to expand our bubble and break the bubble. Yes, um, and I was just gonna say like, it inspired me when I was a kid, even though my trajectory of what I'm doing now is nowhere what I wanted to be when I was a kid. When I was a kid, I wanted to really be a cartoonist. Uh, I drew, I drew comic books. I had my own comic book character called Invisible Man. Um, like I did all these things and it was just by seeing things. Um, I wanted to be a cartoonist because I seen back in the day they had in the Sunday comics um, for the newspaper, they had uh, the boondocks. They had the boondocks yeah. for the Sunday newspaper and then they created the TV show. Right. And I was just like, yes, cartoonists, what? Or uh, comic strips or comic book artists, like, what is this? <laughs> I love it. And they're Black, and they're telling stories of Blackness. I love it. I love it. I love right. it. I love it. And so when I was younger, I really wanted to be a cartoonist. Um, and then that just kind of shifted as time went on. But I, how I pay homage to that is by doing it as a hobby and then also just keeping up with comic books and movies and television. Right. Um, so not to put you back on another soapbox um, or, or at least just like a, an amplified, um, but for those who might be watching who don't, don't necessarily feel comfortable like embracing that nerdiness yet and uh, getting into this culture, like what advice do you have for them to, to start out to embrace this? I know this is cliche, but just be yourself. Um, if you operate in your authentic, uh, authenticity and really just be yourself, you will love yourself for it. You will love yourself for it. There's not going to be that much stress. And trust and believe, people may be picking on you in the high school and elementary and everything, but once you hit college and then so on and so forth, they don't care. <laughs> <laughs> People really don't care. You can be as dirty as you want to be because you're making your own money. You're doing your own thing. Uh, you put time and effort into your hobbies and likes and wants. And I just encourage people that are watching, like, please, just be yourself. I embrace my nerdiness. I embrace my geekness, um, geekdom. And, like, I have in my house, uh, my fiance has seen, I have comic books framed on the wall, like, limited editions. I pay homage to that. That's part of me that I love. I have, uh, I'm waiting to see uh, with my father, if he puts in his will, he has all these collectible Spawn toys and Marvel characters that have cost over a thousand dollars or so for each piece. I'm just seeing, hopefully he puts that in his will for myself. <laughs> You're just going to believe that already. <laughs> I want it. <laughs> uh, but I, I just want people to really, like, you don't have to hide it. Like, you can have wants, likes, and desires. And especially as people of color, like, you can showcase those wants, likes, and desires. And it does, you don't have to be shunned for that. Because, again, Blackness is not a model. You can be anything you want to be. Um, and then you can like whatever you want to be. I'm not much of an anime fan, but I know there's a huge community of Black people that love anime. Like, do you like what you like and express yourself? There's no harm and shame in that. And with that, just like it. <laughs> I, I think that's wonderful advice. I, I think it's so hard to do, to just love yourself and like yourself. So hearing people say it, hearing you say it is very powerful. So what other media do you consider especially strong and vibrant in terms of black culture right now? Ooh, so um, I didn't really talk about, and I'm, it's not superhero television shows, but there's some TV shows that I didn't put on my list that really kind of hit me up, like, oh, okay. 
Uh, one of my favorite TV shows of all time is actually The Wire. Um, it came on HBO. Yeah. Uh, and that show, I think I watched like six times um, all five seasons. Uh, I put my fiance, she just watched it last year for the first time. I was like, yes, I get to watch it again with somebody for the first time. What? <laughs> <laughs> and I, yeah, so I mean, that's an older show. Shows that I'm watching right now that have really like hit me in the last couple of years is really like dark comedy. Mm-hmm. Um, one of those being, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Atlanta. Um, yeah, on FX. Yep, and yeah. it has child, uh, well, Donald Glover, his yeah. rap name is Childish Gambino, but yeah. Glover, he was on Community, which is also one of my favorite television yep. shows. Uh, but he took this, uh, this television show, which is like surreal, kind of dark comedy about yeah. Atlanta and just living in Atlanta. Um, and it's like, blew my mind, like the way it's so little, but it brings out so much of just what blackness is. And again, I'm not from Atlanta, I'm not from the South, but just it, it steps me into that world of like, oh, this is what the culture is in Atlanta. This is what this is what the South is for black people. And it doesn't have to be like, and not, not to say that this is wrong or anything, it doesn't have to be about MLK, it doesn't have to be about, you know, the, the marches and everything, but really just. What does it mean to be black today in Atlanta? And I just love, I love that show because it kind of peeps you under that. And then recently I just got finished watching, I watched it last year when it ended um, in 2020, um, but the first season of um, Lovecraft Country. Oh, heard way good things. Uh, which is also on HBO in like, that show is like, whoa, okay. It throws in like some fantasy um, and really, it's kind of scary in some aspects, but the crazy thing about it is that the show itself, the concept, the fantasy elements are not scary to me. What's really scary to me is they showcase, and I don't want to spoil it, but they showcase some things in the show that kind of deal with the times that they're in. Uh-huh. And it has to do with like segregation. It has to do with like uh, white racist cops and things of that nature. And that scared me more. Oh, yeah. How they kind of unraveled that than... Yeah. The fantasy elements because you had like the monsters and everything in the show that didn't even scare me didn't even i was like i was excited about it i loved it but re- really scared me in that show it's like oh this is what it was like right. it was a real life horror movie yeah <laughs> i was like oh <laughs> yeah. it's like a psychological thriller yeah <laughs> exactly um and so I, I like that show right now um lovecraft country um i've also liked um what's the tv show um, Watchmen on HBO. So I'm an HBO kind of fan. Yeah. I have HBO Max. Uh, but The Watchmen has yep. also yep. been a really good show. I watched the original movie and then some of the comic that, that comic book series is a little too dark for me. Yeah. But, <laughs> but I like uh, the television show was amazing. And yeah. like the concept of just how they kind of paint that picture of like Tulsa, Oklahoma. And like, yep. oh, okay, this is well, okay. I'm really understanding this now. Um, <laughs> I don't want to call out my, my fiance. She was kind of frightened uh, from that show um, because they had the uh, what was it? The Cyclops. The yeah. If you're familiar with the Cyclops that's in the show, mm-hmm. and the whole group that's associated with that, she was just like, "Whoa, what is this?" Ah. And these people that are hiding things. Um, I was like, "Ah, yeah." Um, it's terrifying terrifying yes i loved it i loved it i loved it and then i also like right now where like jordan peele was kind of doing with his horror kind of universe and the horror movie that he's been producing and stuff like that and really that side as well like black people can be in horror films they don't have to die at the beginning of the film they don't (laughs) they don't have to die at the end Or be yep. the magical Negro. They can have complex stories that are placed in horror, the horror genre. And I love that as well. <laughs> Gosh. And it's like, it was more realistic than so many more. Like, the ending of Get Out is absolutely perfect. Like, <laughs> yep. yeah. Ugh. Well, I know. And Jordan Peele, I saw him the other day. Do you, really? Do you, you saw what? him? 
on TV. Oh, <laughs> oh, so good Sundance or I don't know. <laughs> He no, he was on one of my favorite shows called Finding Your Roots. Oh, oh. yeah, yeah. It's on PBS, yeah, yeah. Louis Gates show mm-hmm. where they do genealogical research. So Jordan Peele was one of the guests. Ah. So he was talking mm-hmm. about Get Out and how he was really inspired by Hitchcock and like he'd wanted to be a director ever since he was a teenager. He talked a, a little bit about black nerdiness, just not just briefly, but he touched on it. But he said that his inspiration for making these horror style style movies came from kind of learning about his family history and how the the history of enslavement in his family he felt created like this generational trauma that he felt like just influenced him even now in 2020 and that both the combination of Hitchcock and wanting to be a director and then this generational trauma is what really influenced his making of Get Out and other horror movies. I just thought that was so fascinating. Very much so. (laughs) He's uh, suiting up to be one of my, even though I don't really like horror films, but he's suiting up to be one of my like favorite directors of all time. Behind, I I always have to put, like I said, Spike Lee and Quentin Tarantino, it will forever be my favorites, but yeah. he's coming up there along with some others. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah I'm very- excited. To, I'm excited to see like what his next. Because I know he did like the Twilight series, but I'm excited to yeah. see like what his next like feature. Which is also the- very good. Yeah, <laughs> I forgot you were talking about. Yeah, the Twilight series, uh, Twilight Zone. Yeah, also one of my favorite TV shows of all time, and the reason why that. So my my father was really into Marvel, but mm-hmm. my mother my mother was really into black and white old tv shows and like movies uh one of her movies of all time i think is uh correct me if i'm wrong you can correct me if this is the title i think this wonderful life yeah uh, yes is that the correct title i think it's a wonderful life yeah 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 it's wonderful life. It's one of her favorite movies of all time but her one of her favorite tv shows and we watch it like almost every year um is the twilight zone but the original run in black and white mm. that show I know. I, I loved it. I loved watching that <laughs> show as a kid. Like it totally freaked me out, but yeah, I loved it. <laughs> it's amazing. It's I really good. It. I love it. And I love that they're it's kind of everyone is kind of trying to bring that back in some way or another. So you have like Black Mirror, right. which I love as well. Um, and how that, that modern twist on it with technology. Like I love that. I love anthology series. Um, and kind of like how do you play with different stories each episode and things of that nature? And so, yeah, Twilight Zone will forever be one of my favorites as well. And especially the original run that was black and white. And it was just like, welcome to the Twilight Zone. Oh <laughs> and it was just like, ah! <laughs> no, so I, it, it pains me to know that it's gone from the Tower of Terror. I'm like, oh, yeah. that's so good, please. <laughs> oh, yeah. Such a good yes. series. Um, and then lastly, I would say, as far as and just um, other things, not very much a, a Disney kind of nerd, but I love Pixar films, even though that is part of Disney now. Yeah. Um, this Pixar film in general, so I, didn't, I don't think I put it on my list, but okay. one of my favorite animations of all time is actually, I like Toy Story 1, but I actually like Toy Story 2 a little bit. Uh, but Toy Story is like one of my favorite animations of all time, yeah. that series of films. Um, mm-hmm. I remember watching the first one. I think, I forgot how old I was, but I had action figures. And I was just like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna wait for them to come to life, see what they <laughs> <laughs> You know, let me step out the room and just peek through the window and see, you know, if they, they're doing something, they're gonna get up, they're gonna talk. I love um, it. <laughs> yeah. That's good stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'll do it. I'll, I'll say now just last call for any, if you have any questions, go ahead and put in the comments. Um, but then I'll also ask uh, Mledge if there's any events that's happening. I'm sure there's lots of events happening. What's, what <laughs> events you'd like to, to promote and push out? And we'll post links about them in the comments. Yes, uh, we have next week. So we have a series of this that are going on. But next week we have our Spotlight series. 
in which we're highlighting black faculty and staff. One of those is uh, Dr. Leslie Clover. She's from the law school. Um, she will be doing on uh, conscious identity. Um, and what we try to do with that series is we do it every month, but this is a special month, of course, for Black Fishing Month, but we try to pay homage to faculty and staff here on campus that are actually doing research, that, are, um, that have done works and um, research often, but never really get publicized as much. And so with that series, we try to highlight them and make sure that they, we bring the audience to them for them to get practice and as well as showcase some very interesting things that they're working on. Um, so we have that event. We also have the third week of February, our uh, Black Queer series, which will have Yaya uh, Fairley from um, Black Utah Arts Collective. Uh, mm -hmm. And they will be doing a presentation on um, black queerness, um, which is going to be important, it's going to be amazing. And then we also have, um, at the end of the month, um, we're celebrating our second year anniversary of the Black Cultural Center, uh, which will be on February 26th, uh, the last Friday of this month. Um, and it's going to be special. I uh, believe we celebrate a second year anniversary, as well as during that event, we have our Black Faculty and Awards. Um, banquet, which is our second annual banquet. And we're again, highlighting black faculty and staff that are here on campus that are doing amazing things. Um, it'll be special. And so exciting. Yes, is the anniversary event gonna be online or you're gonna try and do it? Uh, yes, uh, so everyone is welcome. Well, it's, it's on Zoom, but everyone is welcome um, to attend. If you wanna register, just go to our website on the, um, was a diversity.utah.edu slash Black History Month. And then at the very end of that list, you'll see the Black Faculty and Staff Awards. Click on it, the RSVP, you can attend. Anyone on campus can attend. It's open to the public. Um, but we're honoring Black Faculty and Staff here on campus as well as celebrating the second year anniversary of the Black Culture Center. That's exciting. Congratulations on the two year anniversary. That's really Thank great. you so much. Awesome. <laughs> what, a, what a year to, to launch in. Yes, <laughs> so you're a launch in, yes. <laughs> um, well, um, we're coming to the end. All those, all of those events that Malaysia talked about are in the links in the comment below. Um, is there anything else you'd like to uh, talk about or? Um, again, I'll hone on to that message. Like if you're a black nerd and you're listening to this or in general, anybody, a nerd overall or a geek, embrace yourself we are gonna shine as the years go on. Our mediums are being promoted on the big screen, on the television screens, in our homes, um, and our culture will be mainstream and it will continue to be mainstream for the years to come. So just buckle up and be yourself. Thank you so much, Elijah. And thank you so much for uh, meeting, meeting with us and thank you to everybody who has tuned in to watch. Um, thank you so much.